Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Video Essentials 54. This is on population variation and how that applies to population dynamics. And so basically it's that same old idea that variation is important. And in this case, we're talking about genetic variation within a population. This right here is a Tasmanian devil. Tasmanian devil live on Tasmania, which is an island state like about 150 miles south of Australia. Uh, basically, the Tasmanian devil is nocturnal. It's usually found out at night. They have a really disproportionately large head, really powerful jaws, and they go out at night and basically feed on dead and dying material. Um, they're also very aggressive. They have these loud screams and they'll fight for territory and they'll fight other uh, Tasmanian devils for food. Um, but they've been plagued by a disease over the last decade and it's called devil facial tumor disease. It started in 1996 and it's spread across Tasmania and it will probably lead to the extinction of the Tasmanian devil. And this facial tumor disease they get these nasty tumors that build up on their face. Eventually, they make it impossible for them to feed and to breathe, and then they die as a result of that. But it's, it's, it's awful, but what's weird about the disease is its transmission. It's not a conventional virus. It's literally cancerous cells that are transferred from one Tasmanian devil to another. In other words, when these Tasmanian devils are fighting, tissue is being transferred from the sores of one Tasmanian devil to another. And since they lack genetic variability, all the Tasmanian devils are essentially the same. Cancer can be transferred from one to another and create cancerous cells there. Now, can you pick up cancer from somebody else? Not at all. And the reason you can't is that genetically we're so different that our cells, our immune system, is essentially going to recognize that as not part of our self and it's going to destroy those cells. But in the Tasmanian devil, since they've decreased that genetic variability, they're transferring cancer between each other. And they'll eventually go extinct. Uh, there's a captive breeding program that's trying to keep them alive and it's, it looks like there's a few females that are actually immune from this cancer. Um, so basically in this podcast, I'm going to talk about genetic diversity and how a lack of genetic diversity can lead to extinction. I'll, the example I'll give you is the black-footed ferret, but how genetic diversity is very good and, and having a different response to a disease is important. I'll talk about HIV immunity in humans and how some humans are actually immune from picking up the virus or immune from AIDS, and then how we can look at the numbers of those individuals through Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and we can work backwards to figure out the allele frequency of this CCR5 delta 32 mutation. And so basically, variation is good. Uh, let's start with the story of the black-footed ferret. The black-footed ferret is a no nocturnal weasel. They feed on prairie dogs almost exclusively. They'll go out and hunt at night, but black-footed ferrets, we thought, went extinct. Uh, and that's because we decreased the amount of prairie dogs and their population had dropped off. And so by the 1900s, late 1900s, we thought that they were gone. Until a dog in Mitizi, Wyoming, showed up on uh, a doorstep with a dead black-footed ferret. And so they discovered another uh, group of these black-footed ferrets that were alive. It's outside of Mitizi, Wyoming. And so... Uh, the problem was that there were a few of them left and those eventually died off. In other words, their population was so small, they had so small amount of genetic diversity that a few diseases eventually wiped them out. So in 1981, I think they were extinct in the wild. But there's been a captive breeding program to bring back the black-footed ferret. And so they've been breeding them in captivity, releasing them. I think they're in a number of western states and they're making a comeback. I think there are around a thousand of them left. But if you think about it, they've gone through a huge bottleneck when the only black-footed ferrets are the ones that we actually had breeding in zoos and then releasing those. We've reduced that genetic variability. It's going to make them more susceptible to any kind of a disease or any kind of a genetic disease. And so again, variation is important. Um, AIDS is something that's interesting. When we were looking at the AIDS outbreak in the 1980s, we found that there were people who should be getting AIDS that weren't getting AIDS. And we've now discovered it's because they have a mutation. And so if we look in Northern Europeans, we find that in some areas, especially like in Sweden, I'll show you in a second, up to 3% of the population actually are immune to 
getting the virus, HIV. So let's look at how it's transferred. Remember, it's a RNA virus. It's a retrovirus. So basically, they have proteins on the surface that allow them to infect a T lymphocyte. There is a CD4, so this is going to be a CD4 receptor that's going to allow the attachment of the HIV and then entry of the genetic material into the cell. But what's important is there's this protein right here, excuse me, right here called the CCR5 protein. It's in the membrane of a, T, a T4 lymphocyte. And if you don't have that proper protein here, the CD4 receptor can't uh, link up with that HIV and so it can't move in. And so if you can't make that protein, then you can't be infected by HIV. Now where did this come from? We think it came from, if we look at the selective pressure in Northern Europe, it probably either came from the plague or the Black Death or smallpox uh, outbreaks. In other words, with both of these diseases, there were people who were immune to the disease and it's because they had a mutation in this one protein right here, so they couldn't pick up the disease. And so what's happening right now? Well, here's the number of people who are living currently with AIDS. So in the United States, it's over a million. But if you look here in Sub-Saharan Africa, all of these countries, in each of the country, we have millions of people in each of here, each of these countries that are dying as a result of AIDS. But within that population, since there's variability, we're going to find people there that are naturally immune to HIV. And so if we were to come back a thousand years later, we'll find that those allele frequencies are going to be higher in those areas where we had the greatest prevalence of HIV. And what's interesting now is that these diseases years ago are offering protection some, to some of the people today. And so you can see why it's important in a population to have variability because a few of those people will be immune. Just like a few of the female Tasmanian devils are immune from this facial tumor disease and so that will give them uh, a chance at least of surviving. Now how do we know that this person who had this first mutation uh, started in Sweden. Well, if you look at the allele frequencies, we find that they go from zero all the way up to around 0.18 as we get up into Scandinavia. And so how do you figure out these numbers? Well, basically what you're looking at are the people in the population who should be getting the HIV but aren't getting it. They then identified where that is and now they've been able to identify the gene. And so we can apply Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to that. So if we look at, let's say the high end, so if we're looking way down, way up here in Scandinavia, so if I grab a uh, of value. So that means that we have 0.18% of the population. So what are we telling us? That is our Q value. And so that means that 0.82 of the population is going to be our P value. And so in, in our population, 18% of the frequency or 18% of the alleles actually have this Delta 32 mutation, so you can't get the HIV. And so if we want to figure out how many people are actually immune to it, well, you have to have two copies of the gene. And so that's 0.18. So that's going to be 0.18 squared. And so that would be like 18 over 100 times 18 over 100. So that'd be 324 over 10,000. So if we move this over to, so that would be 3.24%. So where the allele frequency is highest, where it's 0.18, 3.24% of the population actually can't get AIDS, or, or at least can't pick up this one strain of HIV. And so what percent of those are going to be carriers? Well, to figure out that, we'd take 2 times P times Q, and that would tell us the number of individuals in this high area that are actually carriers for the disease. And so again, we're tying together all those things we've learned this year. The idea that natural selection can be a selective pressure on those people, that we can see it in the genes, and those genes are expressed in the phenotypes that we have. And we can look at where those are and apply Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to figure out the allele frequencies. And so um, that's populations. That's variation in populations. And remember, variation is good. And once we decrease the size of a population or that variation, we're more susceptible to disease. And so I hope that's helpful.